Welcome everybody to the second annual DevCon, DevCon 2022. Really glad we're here together to just uh, focus on open source software, talk about it. I'm really excited about the agenda we have today and all of the, the wonderful speakers uh, that we have. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. Um, DevCon 2023. Okay, what I, I came across this quote recently. Uh, what is community building? And I really, I really connected with me. Community is defined as a group of two or more people uh, who, regardless of uh, their diversity of their backgrounds, uh, have been able to accept and transcend their differences, um, and they're able to communicate openly and effectively and work together toward common goals uh, while having a sense of unusual safety with one another. And community building is a group process that can lead to uh, deeper, more authentic communication. Um, so I really like this description. And this is what I think about uh, what we're doing today at DevCon is a community building activity. We're communicating with each other and sharing, uh, sharing with each other, trying to build this deep sense of, of connection uh, around our, our common purpose and also celebrating our diversity. So one thing in putting it together I wanted to do is make sure that we are kind of like highlighting different people with different perspectives and doing different things in our development community. Um, I don't have a lot of time uh, this morning, but I actually think one thing I forget to do a lot is take a stretch break. So I want to actually highlight that and uh, let's take just a couple minutes to stretch. We have a long day in front of the computer. So um, so let's just take a couple minutes to do a few stretches together. Uh, so stand up, uh, everybody out of your chair if you're in a chair. And um, Let's do uh, this one, which I like, where you just grab your wrist uh, with one hand. So take your left hand and grab your right wrist, and you can pull up. Um, and this is, this feels good to me. Just pull up with your stretch up with your right arm. Kind of relax your right arm, um, and then switch arms. So uh, right hand uh, goes around left wrist, and just pull. Another thing I like to do is just uh, pull the fingers back because uh, get a lot of like typing and stuff like that. So pulling the fingers back uh, like this, right hand, and then uh, down the other direction. Switch switching hands. Um, and then uh, forward fold, so just reach down to your toes and uh, let yourself just kind of hang there, stretch out to your hamstrings and uh, just, oh, it feels so good. Just uh, stretching out your or, uh, legs. Okay, so <laughs> now we're ready, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think when I spend a lot of time on the computer, I do forget to uh, sometimes take a moment to uh, to do the stretching. OK, uh, I also have a survey that I'd like to ask people to fill out. Um, this is our Hades survey, and I'll put the link in the uh, in the chat for this uh, group. Um, and I might just continue on, but I'd really love it if people took a few moments to fill out the survey. We're trying to collect uh, some feedback on Hades in the uh, in the Hades work group. Um, so, uh, so that would be great. Um, all right. I want to make my talk kind of uh, personal. And uh, and kind of talk you through my Odyssey journey. So it kind of started around 2019. I really before that, but that was when I attended my first Odyssey conference. And uh, I think in 2020, I joined uh, Odysseus, really with the intention of working on Odyssey as much as I can. 
Uh, and then in the last three years, I've been working in kind of two buckets of work, client work and community work uh, at Odysseus and worked with a large number of different uh, organizations and people who are all using the OMOV CDM, using the vocabularies. Uh, and then most recently, I've been working with the Darwin EU project, which in some sense is like the closest I feel like I've gotten to where where I'm sort of working in between this community and and client uh, space. Back in the distant past, I have a BA in economics, and that's maybe really interested in uh, in open source economics uh, and and uh, economics of open source. Two thing, two big ideas I had to really rethink this year. Uh, is that the marginal cost of open source is zero. Uh, that's kind of a, a thought that I used to have. It's like once you cut, when you build open source software, like the co the the marginal cost of that 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 thing is zero. It, more people can can use it, and it doesn't incur any additional cost. And then the open source uh, is created collaboratively, like like how we actually. It's just a whole bunch of people working together to to build it. Uh, and what made me rethink this is a book that was shared in the open source community, Working in Public, uh, by Nadia Eggball. Uh, and she says software is frequently characterized as zero marginal costs, meaning it can be distributed for nearly nothing, regardless of how many additional people consume it. Um, if writing open source code is intrinsically motivated, and if uh, the software actually does scale the mass consumption at zero marginal cost, we'd have a very nice situation. Um, but the problem is not quite that simple. It's code is nearly free to distribute, but uh, the maintenance can be expensive and it's not immediately visible, but software does incur hidden costs over time. Um, this is a quote from the book that I like. Uh, Creation is an intrinsic motivator, but a maintenance usually requires extrinsic motivation. I think this is this is definitely true and something we can take advantage of in Odyssey that a lot of the creative energy that people have is, is very much intrinsically motivated. Um, so she says, I started to see the problem that there's not a dearth of people who want to contribute to an open source project, but rather too many contributors or the wrong types of contributors, um, even though the the uh, and, and really our scarce resource is developer and maintainer attention. And so if we have uh, a, a large sum of contributors uh, that are making small contributions, it can actually kind of uh, put, a, put a strain on the, on the maintainers. So one study found that of 275 popular GitHub projects, uh, less than 2%, like m most people only contributed one commit, um, nearly half of people and, um, and those commits accounted for less than two two percent of of all the the commits. Um, and she says, I realize there's an enormous disconnect between how we think open source works and how I used to think open source works and how it actually works on the ground. Uh, there's a long growing tail of projects that don't fit the typical uh, model of collaboration, including like Bootstrap, a really popular framework where um, used on twenty percent of all websites. 73% uh, of commits are authored by uh, three developers. Uh, she provides a framework to think about different ways of structuring our collaboration. And so project, so in the, in the lower left-hand corner where we have a small number of users, small number of contributors, that's kind of a toy project at the beginning. If we grow the number of contributors, uh, then that becomes kind of like a club and there's like a lot of people who are using the software are really developing the software also. Uh, if we just scale the number of users, then we end up with a stadium type model where you have a very small number of contributors, a very large number of users. And then if we scale up both the number of uh, users and contributors, then we end up with a federation. And these these different models, it's something we want to think about what we where we're trying to trying to get to because uh, they actually have different economics and different ways of of kind of manifesting. So here's a comparison with Rust and Clojure. Uh, Rust would be a federation and Clojure would be a club. Um, in both cases, we have a large amount of the the uh, commits coming from the top few contributors, but Rust is kind of like uh, much larger in scale. Um, 
So the lopsided distribution of work in the stadium model in particular can be partly explained by the supply side economics of scale. Uh, software like physical infrastructure, it has high costs of initial production, uh, followed by low marginal costs. It's expensive to get started. And like, like an electricity company or infrastructure, this, uh, this tends to uh, result in monopolies because of the economies of scale and the difficulty of like getting started. Um, it's cheaper to consolidate those high costs in one place and harder for new entrants to overcome them. Uh, similarly, if we think about who supplies the labor to an open source project, um, it's expensive to onboard new maintainers because maintenance often requires a lot of knowledge that uh, that isn't easily externalized. Um, and so newcomers have uh, tend to make casual contributions and um, and instead of pitching in on more complex tasks around uh, just more complex tasks around the software. Um, and given the high fixed costs into uh, maintainership, the knowledge required to maintain tends to stay concentrated among a few people. Uh, but this is actually key. The longer that we go without externalizing that knowledge, the more difficult it becomes for newcomers to participate. Uh, I asked ChatGBT if git blame was a joke. So uh, git blame is a command in git, which will tell you who authored every single line of source code. Uh, it's not a joke, uh, ChatGPT told me. Um, it's, uh, even though it may sound negative or accusatory, it's actually uh, short for git annotate or git praise. Um, so that's, that's cool. So what I did was run git blame on all of Hades and essentially look at what the distribution of authorship of our Hades uh, uh, source code is. And what you can see, this is a small plot, so I can kind of uh, zoom in, but this is this is the whole thing. And I was looking for R, uh, R files, C++ files, and Java source code files only. Um, and so uh, here we have like the number, the name of the package, the number of authors, and then the, the percentage of lines of code authored by the top author. So here we have like three kind of big authors in self-control cohort, uh, two in data quality dashboard, and then a lot of, and then it kind of trails off after that. Um, let's look at Andromeda, which is the one I worked on. So I, so uh, a lot done by, one person and then some done by another. Um, but you can kind of get a sense of like what this looks like for our for Hades. Uh, there's a lot of packages that are primarily developed or authored by a single uh, person, um, usually the maintainer of the package. And if we look across the entire all of the Hades source code, I we have we have a, a lot a lot of code, but like 60% of it is written by the top two uh, authors. So, uh, and when and we get down to uh, six six authors, it's 90% of the code base. Uh, so I think in Hades we kind of do have this uh, this kind of dynamic. Uh, it, here's Atlas Web API in Circe. What this looks like. This actually has more uh, kind of distribution of of authorship. Uh, but in still, we're after we reach ten authors, we're we're capturing about ninety percent of the the code base. And here I was looking at, uh, yeah, Java code, C plus plus code. Um, I also ran Git blame on Odyssey studies, uh, hundred and two repos, five hundred and uh, twenty nine thousand lines of code. So the top five contributors are responsible for about fifty percent of the the code base. And we actually have, I think, uh, I didn't put it on here, but I think we have about 80 different contributors to Odyssey studies. Um, and I kind of like thinking about Odyssey studies as this like one thing that we want to run that if if we could, we could like run it on each of the CDM databases and we could just keep running all of Odyssey studies on on each database as we uh, want to acquire and want to add uh, evidence to our evidence base. Um, uh, Patrick and Clark and um, uh, uh, Patrick and Clark and Andrew Williams and I are in a program, a training program uh, put on by the National Science Foundation about building open source communities. Uh, 
and it's really fantastic. But one of our homework assignments was to, was to actually kind of draw the community. Um, so I've been thinking about like, what do I think about how to draw our community? I might represent it kind of like this as like each dot is a person. And inside Odyssey, we have we have this kind of nice circle around Odyssey, although it's not a it's not like a not necessarily a clear boundary, but definitely there's differences about inside Odyssey versus outside. And uh, and one of them, I think that Stephen Wally highlighted um, at our uh, a, a year ago when he, we had these uh, really nice forum that we have this sort of difference between customers who have money and no time they're kind of outside and that's a lot of the people that i work with at odysseus and then the community in the community we have time and no money we kind of uh are we don't really exchange money but we exchange a lot of other things that are of value our time our expertise um and i kind of work in this in-between space that's where i'm that's where i'm kind of situated is where i'm oftentimes working with customers um and also trying to work with uh work in the community some um and i i so another book that was that i was uh told about in open source community that was shared with me by clark evans uh was uh this book uh by eleanor ostrom she was the 2009 nobel uh, prize winner in economics for managing common pool resources these are resources usually like natural resources that uh that a lot of people could benefit from but if we kind of overuse them or if they're not managed carefully then they can kind of collapse and uh and it can be bad for everyone uh, she dispels a lot of myths about what the solutions are for managing and 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 studies uh does a really amazing study of long running meaning at least 100 years or more of management of common pool resources um and has a lot has eight principles that she outlines and just has a lot of insight i think we can apply so this is something we'll be talking about in the afternoon session uh with me and clark um so just to wrap up what is a thriving open source ecosystem look like what do i what's my vision for it or what do i think uh it, it looks like um well in economics we have microeconomics and macroeconomics it's like the two big direction two big perspectives and um in microeconomics we're looking at it from the perspective of an individual or an individual actor uh like a like a company uh, or an individual person in macroeconomics we're looking at it kind of from the perspective of the economist or looking at the whole uh, economy together so from a micro perspective for me a big thing is just prioritizing my personal health and that means like not trying to push myself too hard and work on weekends, work on nights, like trying to cram in extra stuff. I think for me, a big thing I had to do this last year was like prioritizing social health, getting out and being off the computer, um, stretching, just that type of thing, because keeping myself healthy, sleeping, huge thing, um, keeping myself healthy helps me become a better uh, long-term contributor. I also think building success, successful products built on open source are really good for open source. If you think about Apache and how that kind of works and evolves, like something like Databricks is built on top of Apache Spark, and that adds value to Apache Spark. Uh, it does. It's not really. I, I think of it as like a very uh, something that that can create a lot of value for the open source software. So I'm really. Uh, positive about people building products, uh, successful products on open source. Um, and then contributing back to the community. We want to incentivize this. I mean, we have some, in, I, I personally have a lot of in, uh, incentive just uh, to do that. I mean, my incentive really comes from the mission of Odyssey and uh, and really the people that the people that are close to me who I've kind of lost along the way of my life because of, of health things. So uh, from a macro perspective, uh, I think we just have a lot to do around understanding the marketplace, the incentive structures at play, understand the options for self-governance, and then incentivize this virtuous cycle where, um, where we can work in a, um, in a commercial space, like Odyssey, uh, Odysseus has to work in this commercial space, but also uh, contribute back to the, the community. And uh, to do that, we're gonna be talking about a cooperative uh, as sort of a model for doing that. Um, so 
with that, that's my my talk. I'm at time actually, so uh, I want. Oh, I actually have one more slide. Um, I want to introduce my next speaker, uh, Clark Evans, who I met at my first Odyssey conference. Incredibly smart, intelligent uh, person who I'm so thrilled to be introducing today. I it's I can't believe I'm introducing him really because uh, he knows a lot more about all this than I do. It has a lot more experience. Uh, and I asked ChatGPT randomly who in invented the programming YAML, and Clark actually, uh, according to ChatGPT, is one of the inventors of YAML, so he has that on his resume. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to Clark. Oh, hello everyone. I'm so it's such a pleasure to be here. I've been watching the Odyssey community for a very long time, and occasionally going to conferences and engaging in a small limited capacities. Um, and let me share my screen, I think. So um, great. So um, I'd like today to talk about a, a, a proposal or some general concept as to how we could engage in uh, a little bit more economically with providing sustainable open source software. And um, and so my background, I've been writing open source software for a long time, starting in, with Python in the early um, or mid 1990s. And I worked on YAML for a few years uh, while I was doing various contract work. And um, then for a good part of uh, two decades, I was working uh, at Prometheus Research as a technical co-founder. And we had several open source projects that I really tried to build a, an economy around, but I was unable to do so. And uh, we had lots of users, um, but it was once again a stadium kind of model where just a few people built it and we were never able to provide a really sustainable future for it. I've been working lately with Data Knots and Fun SQL um, with Kirill Simonoff, and we built uh, an Odyssey cohort expressions tool, which re implements Circe. Um, and that was helpful for finding issues in Circe. And uh, this is a little bit more extensible than Circe is, which has an advantage. But the key takeaway for me for working so long with open source works is funding open source is hard. And people, some people say it's easy and there's several standard ways in order to fund open source works. There are grants, contracts and donations, there's service revenue, there is uh, open core um, uh, of models. And uh, with service revenue, you're often redirecting profits to fund for their work. Uh, grants and donations can sometimes be really uneven and may not actually fund what you need to work on. And open core is something that I just have learned to despise. Um, so I don't want to talk about it. The question is, is there another way to fund open source software? And I think we would like to have a way to build software first and fund later. A way that treats community members symmetrically to where no one is disadvantaged, where no, no vendor has a particular um, specific and or specific advantage over another, and one that lets software be composed without restriction that is compatible with commercial ecosystems. But importantly, if we're going to engage in a commercial ecosystem, we need to be congruent with community values. So first of all, let me start with a disclaimer. Um, the Odyssey founders did encourage me to explore funding exploration and present here, which is awesome, but nothing here is going to change the Odyssey licensing Odyssey and GitHub will remain Apache. This is just a way for us to think about a possibility, some way that we can engage as a community. So um, importantly, this is a community-based proposal. A single vendor or myself can't just go out and do something like this. Um, and, uh, and so there is a workshop at 1 p.m. today. Um, I wanted to ask, everybody can see the, the slides I'm showing? Okay, great, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so how do we fund open source software? The answer is we charge for it. That's a answer. It, it's an answer I'd like to explore here. And one way to one important part about exploring this answer is that we want to have a developer have a total commitment saying, this is how much I really want out of the software to cover my costs. So to do that, we could have a unit price that's fixed. So for example, something that might be charged um, per per uh, research, uh, researcher at a, at, a, at a medical center, for example. And then the number of units for sale is also fixed. And if you combine the two, you get a total price that the developer is saying, this will let me cover the cost for the changes I've made. Critically, 
And this is how we get back to why this is a, a community-based approach is that once all the units are sold, the work becomes Apache, or after a certain time, if the units aren't sold, the work becomes Apache anyway. And most importantly, the licensing is done not by individual actors, but by the community as a whole. So from that being said, um, and that being said, uh, let me let me move forward by saying let's go through some preliminaries. Over the past couple of years, I've had a lot of thoughts as to how to make something like this work, and most of that comes from ideas from other people. And Alvin Ross market design really influenced my thinking quite a bit. Um, and the way he talked about things is, you know, when things are failing and you're not able to um, to do something despite a lot of effort, it may not be your fault. It may be a systems issue. It may be something about your environment that you're engaging in. So look up and say, really, is the environment that I'm building for myself going to lead to success? There's also a questions about what kind of communication is used to allocate resources. Is it the right uh, communication? And are we allocating resources correctly? Um, and also, the, the critical part about market design is that we have market failures when supply is disconnected from demand. That is when people would be willing to pay or otherwise contribute in order to get something, but they can't because there's no way to reach the supply. Or similarly, when there's people who are willing to do something, but they're not able to do so, there may be a communication issue. So these novel solutions, um, a good example of this is a novel solution such as a paired kidney exchange, where basically if I need to give my kidney to my cousin, but I'm biologically incompatible, there's an organization where I can give my kidney to a third party donor, or be a third party donor to a, a, a stranger to me, but some other stranger can donate their kidney to my cousin, in which case this enables that exchange. This is what Alvin is talking about when he's, when he's referring to market designs. There's also a market design that I think is really novel, which is are called collective licensing societies like ASCAP, which does music licensing. And in this particular case, um, Radio stations want to play music, and musicians want to get some compensation for their music. But connecting those two is hard. And by forming a cooperative organization, you can connect the dots to where radio stations can have all the music, the rights they need in order to play a lot of music, and um, various artists can be compensated. So my takeaway from market design from Alvin is we can create a marketplace to our sensibilities, the way we value things. We don't have to create a marketplace or participate in a marketplace that other people have made for us. So um, I'm not going to go over Ostrom too much more. It's a really great book to scan and read in depth. But there's a couple takeaways I have here. Boundaries protect the community. That's important. Communities can solve their own problems. Solutions are also often very local in nature. And you don't scale up common pool resources. You find new ones, and then you connect them. And I think this is a way of very bottom up way of looking at how to build worlds. Um, the cooperative um, movement is also really important to what I'm going to propose today. And the way that you look at this is that communities can engage the world commercially, but not in an equity manner, but with democratically controlled by membership where returns are on investment are well-known, published, and strictly limited. So everybody knows what skin people have in the game, where profits are distributed based upon member, member contribution, not based on any other factors. And what's important about cooperatives is that they permit vertical integration to where a community can work together and compete with the big boys if they want. And we see this in all kinds of um, dairy products, such as uh, Lando Lakes, or um, Horizon Milk, I think. Um, I, I actually may have gotten that one wrong. It may be one of the other milk producers. But um, the goal is, the, the main thing is that um, really large brand names you know, REI um, is our, our cooperatives and, the, and they provide a kind of a compatibility adapter to where the outside world is harsh, but inside we can have a soft little core that does exactly the way we want to behave. I have some observations from open source software. Um, a lot of people talk about what makes software valuable. And we must never forget that the value of software comes from the user community. It really doesn't come from the people who write the software. Software that isn't used has no value. And really, these exponential curves are not about economies of scale. They're about the contributions to the community. When more people are using it, it becomes more valuable. 
the more valuable it is, the more people use it. And this creates this self circle, the self circle. And that circle is what you try to capture in a proprietary market so that you own the value constructed by users. What we want in our cooperative is we want the user value to be captured by the users and not by the developer community because we, we play both roles. We're both users and developers. Licensing needs to be symmetric, no favorites. Most proprietary licensing schemes, licensing is definitely asymmetric. That's the whole point. Otherwise you can't extract revenue from the user community. Um, lower level components in open source worlds are often taken for granted. We shouldn't do that. We need to find a way to pay for lower level components so that they work and they're bug free. And finally, and very critically, software is compositional. We need to be able to build pieces from other pieces. And since software is composed, we need licensing to be composable as well. So I also spent a lot of time looking at copyright law and there's a missing permutation. Copyright law lets creators do two things. Number one, the right to distribute copies and number two, or sorry, the right to restrict distributions and the right and the way to re restrict the right to make derivative works. And if you look at these things as cross-cutting, that you have free of charge products and those with a compulsory fee. You have those where derivatives are permitted and those where, um, where you cannot make derivatives. And in this, we have the typical shrink wrap license, which is proprietary and a compulsory fee. We have free of charge software where it is freeware, it's free of charge, but it's still proprietary. You can't change it if you want to. And then we have ones where are free of charge with derivatives, which is free and open source software. The question is, is there a third option out there that we just haven't explored? And I think there is. And I think we have to use cooperatives in order to do it. So I'd like to get, spend the next, the remainder of the talk, which is only a few more minutes left on the market design. And I may not get through all of it, but we will have a workshop later on today where I can ask for questions and talk about this and more and really listen to you because the critical part about forming any kind of cooperative is that it's not my effort. It has to be a community-based effort or it simply won't happen. So I'd like to provide a vision and talk about cooperative organization and go through some principles of how an organization like this could be formed. Once again, these are just my suggestions. There are ways of thinking about it. I think once everybody gets in, my knowledge will be you know, a great seed, but certainly not the entirety of the work. So the, I would like to picture Odyssey as like a forest and the hardwood is open source licensed. Every single year, we always get new hardwood. New growth can be open source by grants and contracts. New growth can come from open source licensing directly by service revenue as we currently do. But new growth could also be cooperatively licensed and critically, this is the bark on these trees, on some of the trees, not all the trees. And every single year as we pay for those bark, that, that new growth becomes next year's hardwood. And this allows us to grow and, and build. So following a rough sketch of how we might build this for us and how we might think about transitioning new growth and bark into hardwood. So critically, we need to organize cooperatively in order to get this done. A cooperative legal structure, the members are probably developers who build software. The organization needs to be controlled democratically. The staff members need to be elected democratically. The conflicts are handled internally as much as possible, um, according to Eleanor Ostrom's um, policies and her procedures and everything and her ideas. And critically, the important mission is to encourage open source software. All software needs to be eventually Apache. Software becomes Apache once it's paid for, as I previously talked about. Also, we can have software become Apache on its third, third year or something like that, just in case software becomes used, but not enough. Upon dissolution, all software becomes a Apache license. So if this organization cooperative effort fails for any reason, we're left with open source software and not with a proprietary company. Um, being open source is essential promise to customers or we won't be able to, sale, to sell um, and make and get the kind of engagement we wish. Critically, when, if you want to engage with the cooperative, developers would have to have a non-exclusive licensing. Their preferred source code would have to be included. Developers need to have a non-exclusive right to relicense. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, developers need to give their unit price and the number of units sold. So basically they, a developer may say, hey, I would like $5 and I'm all done after a thousand users have, have licensed it. And once those units are sold, the work becomes Apache. 
There also has to be a limited trade name or trademark license in order for the community to engage properly. And other, critically, other cooperatives, other co-op members can make derivative works. As soon as you contribute your source code, even if it's not paid for yet, someone can download the source code, make a derivative work, and start sharing those derivatives with other people as needed. The critical difference between this and open source software, though, is that for someone to use the derivative work, they would need to have a license uh, fee. So let's talk a little bit more about that. First of all, we can compose software. Software can be composed um, in space by using incorporating components or in time by modifying predecessor works. With a cooperative, we can compute the unit price of composite software by adding up all the components. And then as a composite is licensed, so too are all the parts. This allows us to do the deep root, how we can fund the roots of the trees, where basically as soon as a tree is licensed, well, all the roots that contribute to it are also licensed. This gives us that deep funding we need. And that's important for vertical integration. Vertical integration is what Apple and the big boys, it what allow them to make, to become competitive. And because they can keep all their software internally and there's a fluid uh, composition of, of software that they built into a single product that a user can purchase. We need uniform licensing. Uh, where licensing is shared among developers and we would have, and critically, the important part is that the cooperative determines what a unit is. It might start with the idea of one researcher per is one unit, but there could be other ways to licensing. And the important part is, is that we have democratic control over the entity that decides exactly how these new growth would be uh, licensed. The, we, the, this would also have price discrimination to reflect community values. For example, in areas that are, are not as wealthy as um, the United States, for example, there may be discounts. So the cooperative would operate a point of sale, an online store, and th this would allow um, basically a single contact for procurement departments at various medical centers and a single point of contact for any unique licensing needs. There may be some operational costs but because it's a cooperative, the profits would be distributed proportionally to prior sales. There's no equity owners in this, so there's no one making more money. It's just there to basically break even and enable our organization to move forward. Um, so then we may have some baseline quality assurance we need. Um, critically, because the source code is always available and the right to make derivative works is secured, anybody in the community can fix something that's broken. And we may have ways for abandoned trademarks to where a, a new developer could assume those. Um, so, but overall, like open source software and most commercial softwares, there's no real warranty. And this also could allow us to fund existing maintenance for, of open source software. As I said before, how software is composed of other software products, there's no reason why we can't have existing free component products with a price tag on them anyway, even though they're open source licensed. This is just a way for us to fund open source works. Anyway, um, these are just starting ideas. Um, we're going to have a workshop uh, this afternoon for anyone who's really invited about talking about this more. Critically, cooperatives only work when they're community-based, and they only work when we have shared values and we work together. So um, anyway, I think we, should, we might want to just start small and just as adjust we go. If you're interested, please join us. Thank you so much.